Hello, everybody, and welcome to this CFD webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about pipe flow and specifically comparing numerical and analytical pressure drop values. My name is David, and I'm part of the CFD team. And I'm based in Munich. I've got Matt with me here today. So, Matt, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, hi, my name's Matt. Um, I'm based out of the Boston office. I've been supporting CFD for um, almost two years now. Okay, great. So, Matt, just let me know if uh, you can see my screen. Yeah, you're good to go. Okay, so today's contents, we're going to be firstly talking about why we need to look at pipe flow, and then we're going to be going over to the general theory and the, the setup that we recommend you guys to, to have a go with when you're performing your pipe drop calculations, and then we're going to look at wall roughness, which is a bit of a specific case, and then we've got some example CFD for you. So we're going to go over a verification model, and then Matt's going to give you some of his uh, practical experience from his support cases. Okay, so why pipe flow? It's basically just to act as a verification of the software, because it's something that we know that there's lots of, um, we know all the analytical results, and there's lots of, there's lots of theory, and we can um, easily compare this. It doesn't seem to have that much practical application because the um, the calculations are from the theory are nice and accurate, but um, it's just a good test of showing that our CFD software is modeling reality and agreeing with theory. Right, so pretty much any uh, commercial CFD package has got a bench line, pipe flow. Um, I'm sure many people on um, the call here have done it in school. Um, as I, you know, I know I did, and um, it, it's just a good benchmark. So, cool. So, looking at um, turbulent and laminar pipe flow, the um, the level of turbulence is is measured by or indicated by the Reynolds number. So, lower than two thousand three hundred, we um, define it as laminar flow. And then you've got a transitional zone up to 4,000 Reynolds number, and above 4,000, we're looking at fully turbulent flow. And um, so the entrance length requirements. Oh, we'll get to this. We'll get to this later. We need to explain what an entrance length is. So when um, a velocity profile enters a pipe, the non-slip. Uh, boundary conditions or the, there's a no slip condition on either wall on both walls which means that the water or the fluid is actually stationary and this develops a, for a boundary layer and once these boundary layers fully develop this requires a um, what we call an entrance length so the entrance length is the is the length of pipe required before the flow is fully developed and we can see here that the um, on the second picture, that the velocity profile of turbulent and laminar pipe flow is actually quite is quite different. So we're going to be going over the theoretical approaches to both laminar and turbulent pipe flow. So as I've just explained, this is about the um, you've got a uniform velocity profile going into a pipe, and then as the boundary layer grows on both sides once they reach their maximum size then you have fully developed flow and this can take up take a long time so in a um, pipe of say two meter diameter with a hundred meter length and a volumetric flow rate of one meters cubed per second the entrance length can actually be around 80 meters so up until that 80 meter point you actually don't have fully developed flow so it's not really modeling as the, the so when we when we're looking at the pressure in the pipe, we want to be waiting until the flow has fully developed before we're actually measuring the pressure drop within that pipe. Yeah, um, and David, just a couple comments here. Um, again, this is pretty well known stuff, but the diagram just shows obviously to you know have mass conservation you need to have an acceleration of, of velocity at the center um, and uh, and David's absolutely right analytical results or you know hand calculations out of a textbook assume fully developed flow so 
Um, the most classic uh, support case uh, we get here is someone wants to make sure the software is working. They have a one meter pipe, uh, do the hand calculation for one meter of pressure drop and say it's not working and file support case. Um, so you just have to go check uh, based on the you know fluid material, um, Reynolds number and other um, you know parameters. Um, you know, usually, although we can get into it, but usually more than half the pipe ends up being uh, an entrance length period. So. So getting into the the real theoretical stuff that we uh, we're, so we take our theories from the um, Frank White's book. This is one of those those classics that I'm sure all of you know from university. Um, so here are the equations for for laminar pipe flow. This this slide is really just for reference. I'm not going to go over all the all the equations, but what we need to know is that there's a theoretical expression for finding the entrance length, which is Le in this case. And uh, for laminar flow, that is given here by 0.06 times the Reynolds number times the diameter. And the Reynolds number that we use in pipe flow is using the diameter of the pipe as the characteristic length, as you can see here in the, uh, in the boxed out expression. I'm sure all of you know this. So with um, them, when we're working out the, the theoretical pressure drop, Again, we're, um, we're assuming fully developed flow at this case. So you have to measure your pressure drop over a length past the entrance length. So if your entrance length is 80 meters, then you need to start measuring your pressure drop from 80 meters to the end of your pipe. Okay. Right, and just one comment. Um, you know, if we say Brown's number of 2300 is the, is the upper threshold um, for, for laminar, it, you know, it shows that you can have uh, 138 diameters length of entrance length. So for laminar pipe flow, uh, it requires um, more entrance length and turbulent. Um, today, we actually, our, our examples are just from, although we have done both and the QA team does both, our uh, examples are for turbulent pipe flow because it's just more of a practical application. Mm -hmm. And so a really important part of the pressure drop equation is having the friction factor so um, we'll get onto this later but you can find all these friction factors depending on whether you've got either laminar flow or and then moving into turbulent flow and having either a smooth pipe and then increasing the roughness of the pipe and we'll, we'll get into that uh, in two slides time but um, just for reference here is the theoretical pressure drop for turbulent flow the same pressure drop equation but with a different entrance length requirement and a different friction factor and this friction factor here is uh, assuming that it's a smooth pipe okay so as I was saying about wall roughness and the transition from laminar to fully turbulent flow here is where you can find your friction factors and it's called a Moody diagram so in that um, in that laminar pressure drop equation we're using this first line here where the F is 64 over the Reynolds number. Okay, so that's how you would be calculating your laminar pressure drop. And as we move into um, turbulent flow, for smooth pipes, we're starting right at the bottom, this, this bottom curve, and that's given by the uh, Blasius correlation um, that we gave in the previous slide here. So with the 0.316, Reynolds number to the power of minus a quarter that is essentially modeling this bottom line for smooth pipes and then as we increase the relative roughness which is the absolute roughness divided by the diameter of the pipe as we increase this we can see the different friction factors here that you would use for your analytical calculations and then when we want to um, start thinking about numerical calculations using a CFD simulation this is the uh, general setup that we would recommend. So when we're talking about the geometry, the crucial geometry is the length, and you have to make sure that the length of your geometry is at least as big as the entrance length plus the amount of pipe that you want to measure the pressure drop across or over. And um, we normally recommend these, these basic boundary conditions using a, a flow boundary condition at the inlet, either a velocity, mass flow rate, or volumetric flow rate. 
um, and simply a pressure equals zero boundary condition at the outlet. Meshing, we've seen that the best results seem to um, occur when we have a nice regular mesh and we've got three approaches for this. So you can either stay in automatic meshing mode and apply a uniform mesh. You could do a purely manual mesh, which means that there's no variation or an extruded mesh, which, um, which is creating a, um, it's similar to the wall layers in that um, it's, it's a, how do we explain this matter? Parallelogram? No. Well, it's, call it? it's, it's not a tetrahedral. They, they basically mesh the surfaces at the um, entrance and the exit and then just extrude mm -hmm. them straight down the pipe um, and, and segment them into chunks. Um, yeah, so it, it's more just like a block or, so, or something like that. But yeah. extruded mesh um, saves a, an incredible amount on element count and um, it, it's really robust for pipe flow. Um, yeah. So I, you know, we use it in heat exchangers all the time. Um, I, I use it with, with good success. I'll show you um, uh, with a pressure drop calculation and so on. It's, it's a great fu uh, function. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously when we're meshing, we need to have consideration of the turbulence model that we're going to use. So when you're, when you're applying your wall layers, you want to ensure that you're going to get a Y plus value in the correct range for the turbulence model that you're using to perform well. And because the Y plus value is dependent on, on the flow, you need to actually run a couple of tests so that then you see what your Y plus value is and you can adjust your wall layer settings in accordance to try and bring it into the, into the range where the turbulence model is known to perform best. And another nice thing to uh, utilize is symmetry planes when we're meshing. So you could, if you're using a pipe, you could either cut down into, um, you say, a quarter, but that would be a nice way of um, doing a 3D model. Um, so you you put symmetry planes on the on the um, on the plane faces there, and that would obviously you need a quarter of the element count, which is which is nice. And also, 2D um, axisymmetrical simulations are known to perform really well. So if you really want to save on mesh completely, then go with a 2D. Awesome. Um, and yeah, I just, this is perfect. I was going to mention uh, one other thing on, on turbulence models. Um, I, I've had good success um, with pressure drop using either of these turbulence models. A lot of people ask me, you know, which one is better? Um, and I really don't like that approach because you can get both the work. They just have very different meshing requirements. Um, and so I, I'll let David speak to this, but um, you can get either to work and, you know, um, yeah, you just really have to be careful. It comes down to mesh. Yeah, exactly. Because it's a quite a simple flow problem and these turbulence models are designed with these. So say the, the uh, wall layer formulation of the K epsilon model is actually sort of it's, it's perfect for this scenario where we don't have flow separation. It's it's going to be a nice, smooth boundary layer um, and so we know that the k epsilon um, wall function should be suitable for this kind of approach and the k epsilon model is um, much more um, or much less element intensive because you don't need to bring down the y plus value to the same degree as the uh, sst k omega because with the sst k omega for best results we're looking at 0 0.3 3y plus so and that's gonna that's gonna use a real like a, a really big element count whereas with the k epsilon model we can get satisfactory results or if not perfect results without um the element count which is nice and so the default wall layers for k epsilon it's uh, three layers with a layer factor of 0 0.45 and a gradation uh, it's set to auto, but if you increase your layers to five layers, we seem that this brings the Y plus value closer towards 35 and me and Matt have both been getting really nice results with just adding two extra layers and not really worry about too much more um, messing with the, with the settings. Yeah. Um, for some reason, um, you know, five wall layer seems like the sweet spot for, for K epsilon. Uh, the default is three and, 
three will actually get you quite satisfactory results, but five really seems to be narrowing in on, on close to perfect. Um, again, you could use, you know, um, SSTK Omega, but you're just going to be adding more mesh. Um, so, so why mm -hmm. waste your time, really? And it's also, it takes more iterations to converge the K Omega. So you're basically just going to be increasing your computer requirements for, for very little gain. Um, I've just got to correct this one, the first point in the slide there. It says Y plus should be between 35 and 350. And there's, a, there's a typo there. Okay. That happens. <laughs> so other solver settings. Advection schemes, ADV4 and ADV5. Um, me and Matt have used both in these examples, and they both perform well, but ADV4, if you notice in the help documentation, it says it's specifically tuned for flows in long, narrow pipes, and that's exactly what we're doing, so we might as well take advantage of it, and it is giving nice results. Further to that, you want to turn off your intelligent solution control and automatic convergent assessment. It seems like the um, relaxation factors, if we're using intelligent solution control, after a certain number of iterations trying to reach convergence, it seems to actually um, push the results off from from the results that we're looking for. Um, but yeah. I, I can uh, embellish a little bit. Um, you know, the, the development team has really uh, tuned the solver to uh, for stability, which means it's going to take more than, um, you know, with, you know, with quotes, your average amount of iterations to, to get like a benchmark. If, if you're trying to um, match experimental data, you know, or for example, you know, people do the um, you know, NACA 0012 airfoil. If, if you're trying to benchmark these things, you've got to go way up on on iterations. Mm -hmm. um, and ISC, what that does is change the you know, relaxation um, parameters on the fly. We really don't want that um, because after things start stop changing for the most part, when you think of velocity and pressure, ISC doesn't uh, do us a whole lot of good. Um, and again, we don't want this kicking out of uh, convergence, so turn automatic convergence assessment off. Mm -hmm. And I didn't actually realize this. So for all the examples I've been doing, I had it turned on and I couldn't work out why I wasn't getting good results. Turned it off and about 10 minutes ago, my results came in looking perfect. So it's definitely a big point. Uh, with with both turned off, you have to manually um, validate whether it's converged or, or not. So just ensure that you have a sufficient number of iterations and then you can, uh, by inspection, tell whether it's uh, converged or not. So if we look at this for, for a valid, validation um, exercise, so on one of the verification models that we have internally, the um, the developer used 4,500 4, iterations to, to reach full convergence. But I mean, this isn't particularly practical for for normal applications. And as I'm showing here by the um, the development of the static pressure with the number of iterations on the bottom there, you can see that actually there's very little variation after 2,000 iterations here. And um, Actually, with both of our examples, me and Matt have used 1,500-ish for a nice result. Yeah, and I just want to add here, um, you know, when I try to teach people how to use CFD or support them, I'm always going for bang for your buck. So you can see um, if you're not, if you're just trying to get a, a ballpark, you know, call it under 5%, maybe on, under 10% is good enough for you. Um, you know, a thousand iterations, um, which even in some applications may be overkill, but it, it's going to show you what you need to know. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we position this product as easy to use and upfront simulation. And, and this is it, basically. Um, you don't need, you know, you may have to do 4,000 iterations, but that's if you're trying to hit a, a textbook value. Another way to see if you do have nicely converged results is to put a monitor point where you're at the end of your uh, entrance length. So this is the point that we really we really need a nicely converged solution. And if you can see here, so with the global, if you're looking at all the global average results, it actually looks like the, um, like the simulation is pretty well converged. Whereas if you're looking at the monopoint, monitor point of where we're measuring the pressure drop, 
it's actually there's still quite a lot of fluctuation here so it's just it's just worth bearing in mind that maybe use a monitor point before you um to help assess the uh, convergence yeah global um results can be a little sketchy because it's hard to um wrap your head around you know what is that showing you um mm -hmm. a monitor point is, is really easy because you know it's a point in space just one last comment about the bottom uh, plot we don't know what the magnitudes of those residuals are but what you can do is instead of uh, showing all the values at once, you can scroll through. So say, just show me VX velocity, just show me VY, just show me pressure. And as you do that, um, it'll give you a max and min on the Y axis. And I tend to um, make the start from iteration one to farther out. So maybe towards the end of the simulation, I'll go to iteration thousand to 1500, isolate pressure and see how much it fluctuates. You may, um, show it's, you know, the whole thing's on the same order of magnitude and, and that's a good, uh, good sign. So. Hmm. And lastly, for a setup, if we want to add a bit of uh, reality and complexity to the simulation, we're going to consider wall roughness. And uh, you do this by entering the height of the wall roughness in the materials editor. And so you can either um, apply this to the fluid or to, if you have solids in your simulation, you can apply it to the solids as well. And the wall roughness will be applied to every wetted surface. And um, the if you apply different values, so you say one to the fluid and a different one to the solids, the solid value will override. And another point on here is that the Wall, the, the roughness heights are not actually seen on the geometry. They're just taken into account in the, in the turbulence model. So you're not going to be able to zoom in and see the wall roughness if you were hoping to do that. And a key point for usage is to, to include the effects of wall roughness within turbulence models. You need to turn off the intelligent wall formulation so that the roughness is actually taken into account. In the K epsilon turbulence model, the intelligent wall formulation by default is switched off anyway but for the SSTK omega it is on by default so just make sure if you're using SSTK omega switch off your intelligent wall formulation before implementing wall roughness okay so now we're going to be going on to some examples so Matt over to you right right uh, just give me one moment Matt, shall I keep the PowerPoint on my screen here, or shall we transfer over to you? We can transfer to me. Um, I just need a minute here. Okay. All right, with any luck, I think you can see my screen. Um, well, it's the same as my screen at the moment, but so I'll change yeah. mine. <laughs> Good point. Okay, there you go. Now we're in. Awesome. Yep, that's you. All right, so um, as you guys probably know, we have some verification test models that we put in the help documentation. Um, and admittedly, we don't have all the information uh, there. It's just kind of something we've been doing. Um, it's not down to me or anything, but I thought what I would do is break out those example, do it, have it be a little more clear. You guys can see what's going on. Um, so with that, all right. So the 3D turbulent pipe flow model, um, it's you know, 3D, of course, it's we're doing a, uh, a quarter model, basically. So we have two symmetry planes. Um, so if you look in the help documentation, this is going to be the one that's showing uh, a thousand cubic meters per second. Uh, it's a hundred meters long and two meters in diameter. Um, of course you have to split the, uh, the inlet, um, volume flow rate, um, and scale it, um, with your, with your symmetry planes. Um, and if you'll notice, we have a density of, uh, 10, 10 kil kil kilograms per meter cubed and a viscosity of 0 0.01 pascal seconds. Um, and if you start looking, you'll notice this isn't a physical material. So the reason this is done is 
it was benchmarked a long time ago in a fluids textbook, and there's basically a perfect solution. Um, so it's not water, it's not air, it's, it's really, you know, neither of those. Um, here we assume a, um, a, a smooth pipe, and so our friction factor comes out of just using the, you know, the, uh, the Blasius uh, correlation. Um, it would calculate entrance length there, and then we gave ourselves some more room. So the pressure drop we're, we're worried about um, is the last 40 meters. So we actually have about uh, 4.6 extra meters in there. Um, so if, if you do an analytical delta P on the last 40 meters, you're going to get 201,566 uh, uh, pascals. So... All right, so there's kind of the, the picture. Um, we, we use the, a uniform mesh, and it, it actually really, it's interesting, it doesn't have to be very uh, fine at all. Sometimes I'll see people who are getting poor results and they start adding millions of elements. And this, I think, was only a few hundred thousand. Um, and we really nailed the answer. Um, so like I mentioned, the, the five wall layers seem to be a sweet spot. Instead of the default 0.45, um, um, layer factor, and we went with 0.9. Um, David and I were kind of chatting. and I think the first layer is going to have the biggest impact because that's kind of how the the, um, the Y plus is going to be calculated a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, so I encourage you to try yeah, it. Thinking, sorry, Matt. Yeah, I think there can be some variation in that layer factor. So I was using, I'd brought it right down to a 0.35 yeah with uh with with my mesh but my mesh was a little bit more element intensive so it sort of looked like quite a nice smooth transition mm -hmm. but that was throwing nice results so there's you can play around with this stuff but it seems like there's a there's a quite a big window where we're getting nice results yeah the the takeaway here is you don't need 15 wall layers or something crazy like that um and auto layer gradation uh seems you know uh, seems to be appropriate um, like I said, we're using 4,500 iterations, which is a ton. You know, that's that's what it's it's going to take if you want to get that 1% accuracy. If you want to get 5%, you know, you probably only need 1,000 iterations. Um, and uh, like David said, turn ISC off, use ADV5. Um, I have more success with ADV4, but at this point, you know, either are going to be appropriate. Um, yeah, and like we said, uh, stick to K-Epsilon turbulence model. So here's just an XY plot of the entire pipe. You'll see the parametric distance on the bottom is 100 meters, which is the length of the pipe. And you can even see, um, you know, some non-linearity uh, to the beginning, which is kind of interesting. It looks like, you know, the, the first 20 meters from zero to 20 meters is really non-linear, which kind of goes to show why you need that entrance length. Now, interestingly enough, uh, not to get distracted here, but we say the entrance length has to be about 55 meters. And um, I mean, to be honest, after like 30, things look linear, which is what it should be. Um, so maybe you can cheat some instances, but if you want to do it right, use the hand calculation um, and, and leave yourself enough entrance length. Um, and like I said, we're, we're measuring pressure drop for 40 meters. So we're going from uh, you know, meter 60 to meter 100, which I highlighted there. Now, this is just me zooming in on the, the, the last 40 meters there. So you can see we're just over 200,000, um, and we go down to zero because we have that zero pressure um, outlet boundary condition. Now, you can see on the y-axis in bold, it says the, the max is 203,584. Uh, um, and I think I'll show in a second, but I think um, our analytical was 201,000, uh, roughly. So we're already really close there. Um, and the next question that I'll get into in a second is, you know, how do you measure um, your your, uh, your pressure in CFD? So there's always some, um, it's always up to interpretation, really, um, of projects like this. You know, do you measure a single point? Do you do a bulk average across the plane? Do you use a monitor point and, and average the last 100 iterations? Um, you could argue any of those points are, are valid. Um, and so here... Um, I, I did all three. So I use an XY plot that's going right down the center of the pipe. Um, 
but again, it's only measuring points in space. It's not an area average. Uh, and um, yeah, you see a CFD value 203584, and I get 1% error, um, which is pretty good. Um, I used a monitor point, and what I did was um, I, I averaged over the last 100 iterations, um, which, by the way, there was pretty much no fluctuation. But I, I decided to average from iteration 2400 to 2500, and it seemed to drop the error by a negligible amount. Um, and then I used the bulk calculator as well. So what's really different about the bulk calculator is that it's um, an average over the the area, uh, the cross section of the pipe, which is kind of interesting. It really shouldn't change, and as you see, it it really doesn't. Um, so um, I would say, you know, more or less, I think we kind of kind of nailed these. I mean, it's it's good shape, um, and you know, maybe some of you folks can do a better job than myself on on this, um, or or maybe um, you know, one of our QA members or developers could do a better job, but this is kind of what I was able to pull together without, um, you know, pulling my hair out. And I thought it was pretty good. Um, and uh, I have one more example here. What I'll do is I'll show um, both examples and then we can jump into CFD and I can show you guys models. Um, some people have been asking questions. Please feel free to, to drop questions into the, the box there at the bottom. Um, all right. So here's kind of an interesting example. So this came out of a support case last summer um, where someone was trying to benchmark the software. Um, you know, as they should, they want to have faith in the software. They learned how to do um, pressure drop calculations in school or on, from a textbook. They want to benchmark it. Um, and so here, what's, you know, a little more interesting, we're using more, uh, real material. So we're using water. Um, and we basically have a one meter pipe diameter um, of two centimeters, um, and we're using a velocity a flow rate of, of 4.91 meters per second. Um, density, I think we're slightly underneath uh, standard temperature and pressure. Um, but yeah, you, if you just look, those are pretty close to, to STP. Um, if you look at density and viscosity. Um, now in this demo here, basically I'll do the same um, boundary conditions and and um, pipe size, but then I'm going to do a rough wall example, and then I'm going to do a smooth wall example, um, so I can show you. Um, so in this, it was some kind of like sand um, roughness of 0 0.04 millimeters um, of absolute roughness on the pipe, um, when, which was kind of interesting. Um, the I calculated the Reynolds number; it's, it's very high. It's over 110,000, which is huge. Um, and the entrance length is 0.6 meters. Now, I want to stress something here. Um, I, I pulled this from a support case that I did, um, and, and things aren't perfect in this setup. I, I didn't build this setup. Um, a customer did, and then I helped them and, and decided to benchmark it on my own. So the entrance length is 0.6 meters, but I'm actually measuring pressure drop. That analytical delta P is for half a meter, um, which means we're measuring flow where it's actually not perfectly um, fully developed. Um, in the end, it looks like that has a net um, a really negligible impact on results. Again, like I said, um, take it with a grain of salt, but mostly developed flow really seems to get you 99% of the way there. Um, so we're very close to fully developed, but in a perfect world, we should make this pipe 1.1 meters long, not one meter long. Uh, but regardless, for half a meter pressure drop, analytical solution is uh, 7,511 um, pascals. Um, and again, this is for a rough wall. Now, I wanted to break out and show this, this Moody diagram. So if you look at the relative uh, roughness, um, all you have to do is uh, take the 0 0.04, uh, I think it was millimeters, multiply it by the diameter of your pipe and sorry absolute roughness and you'll get a relative roughness of um, 0 0.002 um, now you want to follow that I drew in these uh, these red lines that just show you guys how I pick the friction factor um, you want to look at your Reynolds number which is about 
a hundred thousand, very close to a hundred thousand, and and you know narrow in on a data point. Um, and you could see I'm right around um, for a friction factor zero point zero two five, um, which is uh, what I ended up using. All right. What was really cool about this example um, is that I was able to use an extruded mesh and I, I really didn't have a lot of uh, mesh at all. It just saves you, compared to tetrahedrals, it, it saves you uh, maybe an order of magnitude on element count. It's pretty incredible. Um, so I did that automatic assignment, um, you know, maybe refined it a tiny bit and then extruded um, from beginning to end. I used fall, uh, five wall layers. 0.45 layer factor like we've been talking about and I only went 1500 iterations um, and again ISC off ADV4 I did try ADV5 but ADV4 just gave me the edge by a small small margin uh, now the way I have these things ordered here's my smooth wall um, and I'm going to show results at the same time. Now, um, absolute roughness and relative are, are not applicable here. Um, basically, uh, in order to get a, um, a friction factor, I'll use the Blausius correction. Um, and I'll show you. So again, all the boundary conditions and pipe size are the exact same. The analytical is 5,198 Pascal pressure drop exact same pressure drop length and all. Now, um, like David explained um, earlier, you're going to want to look at that first curve. The, the lowest curve represents a smooth pipe. Um, in real life, you probably wouldn't use a Moody diagram unless you had to, um, but you would use the, the Blausius um, correction. But here, you know, it basically shows, um, I end up using a 0 .0, um, one seven, I think three, uh, friction factor, um, and it's always good to check that your, you know, your equation matches your Moody diagram. I just noticed it says Moody diagram, which I think is a different webinar topic we can do. But uh, all right, cool. So here are my results. Um, I was really able to nail the, the smooth pipe uh, to within less than one percent, which is pretty awesome. Which I was really happy about, especially it being a, um, a a real material and all. And then the rough pipe, I my error was about two and a half percent. Still quite good though. Um, and you know maybe I could with more more effort get that down. Um, but I, I was really you know this goes to show uh, you know I support the software every day and have have good faith in its capabilities and all. And, and this is why because uh, I've seen it really nail um, benchmarks like this, um, along with more complicated ones. So um, those are my two examples. And in a second here, I can uh, jump out and show you guys the share files. So give me one moment, please. David, feel free to jump in if you got anything to say here. I was trying to work out a joke about mood diagrams, but not getting very far, actually. Yeah. That's a tough one. <laughs> All right. Um, so we have a few questions, which is pretty awesome. Um, it actually just gives me a place to start, which is nice. Um, I'll dive into my own example. And um, folks, please, if you have any questions, type into the box. If you'd like to see, um, you know, uh, live what my model setup looks like, uh, now's the time. So, so go for it. David, just give me a second here. I'll share my screen. Uh, CFD project and we can kind of jump in here. All right, so we've got a uh, question about why we wouldn't solve this in 2D. And to be honest, we would. Yeah. You know, to save, to save, uh, element count we would but it's um it's using the verification 
results from 3D experiments and things. But to be honest, there's no reason why we wouldn't do 2D. Matt, can you think of a reason why we wouldn't do 2D? Well, um, I guess we just really have more degrees of freedom in the 3D. And if you look at our benchmark studies, the, the 2D results are just in a hair better than the 3D. Um, but, you know, in support, we uh, we kick and scream all day saying do things in 2D. So I think it, this is a great reason, uh, great application for 2D. Uh, what I'm just going to do here, I don't want to muddy up an example. All right. So someone asked how to how do we measure these? All right. Um, David, you can see my screen, right? I've got it. Yep. OK, so X, Y plot. Um, basically, drop in a, a plane. You're going to have it go the entire length of the pipe. And I like to see these things straight on. And you're going to uh, go to the upper right hand corner, X, Y plot. And I think. Give me a second here just so I can recall. 0.005. Okay. Matt, so, before you go into results, do you want to just quickly chuck in a monitor point and show, um, show well, everyone how to use a monitor point? I'll do it afterwards. Let's do it afterwards. It, it might uh, yeah. throw off my, my result set. All right, so uh, we're going to key in. Um, I just looked up. You want to get in the middle of the pipe. And then here, so we're doing 0.5 because it's half a meter measure. All right, there it is. Um, so we see that 5,292. Um, and I, um, there's basically the, the measurement value. Um, there's your XY plot. Um, and all right, bulk calculator. That's another easy one. So you would put it in the Z. Edit, uh, point on a plane. All right, we're already at half a meter, but you would just enter the, the half a meter. That's where we're going to measure. Uh, Pascals, boom, there we are. Um, and then monitor points, let's do it. So these have to be done um, in the setup beforehand. But if you go under simulation, uh, hit monitor point. There we go. So um, you say pressure. This is, you know, exact same. Um, what's the other. If you zoom in, you should hit, hit the hit the plus button. I would. Not. Yeah. There we go. So you get a red dot. So it's a point in space. The big advantage with monitor points is you'll see. Um, you're going to see results, uh, every degree of freedom, at, you know, all the velocities, pressure, um, et cetera, um, for every single iteration. And you can export that as CSV data and look at it. So it's really awesome. Um, We've got a customer saying that um, they can't save monitor point coordinates, but they should just stay in this dialogue. Right. In my experience. We don't have experience. Or we don't have the capability to read in monitor point uh, x, y, z data like we do for points. So you do have to enter it here. But once you enter it, you know you can clone a scenario. It'll stay there. You can rerun. You know they're going to be there. Um, and, to, and to look at the uh, things after, they're going to be here instead of global over on the right hand side. They're going to be um, listed there, and and you can save out a CSV there. If you're not sure about the units on the monitor points, you can always check. Um, I think it's the status file or the summary file. Uh, nope, summary file. So they're going to be these base units. So you can see here, uh, Newton over meter square, that's Pascal. So our, our monitor point data is going to be in Pascals. Um, all right. Yeah, there's really nothing crazy to this, uh, this setup. Um, I guess I'll look, show you the solve dialog box. 
Again, 1500 iterations, ISC off, um, ADB4, uh, standard capsule on turbulence model. Um, yeah, and so let's do, I'll show you the um, material. So if you want to enter, now notice in this model, it's kind of interesting. Um, so I don't actually model the, the wall here. So we allow you to input a wall roughness either on the fluid or on the uh, solid material, of course. Um, here it would just be kind of a waste of time to model um, your, your, uh, your pipe wall. So if you look in here, um, look at wall roughness, there it is, um, in meters. Uh, and this is the absolute wall roughness, not the relative, just a heads up. Um, so um, that's pretty interesting. Um, and the default wall roughness for everything is zero because it's, you can do these studies on your own. It's not going to have an incredible impact on, um, on your, your results in a practical sense. You do something like this, it's going to affect your results. But if you're trying to model electronics cooling or something, the roughness of your materials is not going to affect your fan curve. Um, and we really like to take a, a practical approach to, um, to our CFD simulations. Um, all right, give me a second here, David. And we're having some discussion here on uh, monitor points. So let's see. Monitor points created in scenario three is not available in scenario one. So I, I think what you mean there is um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not like a summary item where we just add it in all the scenarios. Um, no, if you, if it's you not like it, a point. Right. I mean, if you add it to a scenario and then clone the scenario, it will be available in the next. But you have to input them into every brand new scenario. Um, and, uh, yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I, many, I think many people get confused between a results point and a monitor point and the monitor point is literally just for convergence and you do this as a setup task rather than a results point which can be used as a summary so i think you're you're hoping for that um that usability of the results points but um the monitor points unfortunately don't work like that it's just if you clone the scenario you'll keep the monitor point but um you won't be able to look at monitor points in previous scenarios Thanks, David. Um, all right, if anybody has any other questions, please uh, let us know. Um, there's really not a lot to these setups, but I encourage you guys to, to go chase it on your own if, you, if you'd like and reach out to support if you have questions. Um, what we'll do too is, is share these um, input models like we always do with the box link. We'll put the webinar on YouTube you can go to our public box folder, download the share files, and run them on your own. And uh, then, you, then you can believe us. <laughs> Seeing is believing, right? All right, uh, David, do you have anything else to comment on? No, I think, I think you've covered all the essentials. All right. Um, well, everybody, thank you for joining us today. Um, all right. Um, everybody, Matt, thank we, you. I think we just, um, lost your your goodbye message. So. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, again, we'll we'll put the the recording on YouTube. Uh, we'll have a link to the, the box folder, um, and. Um, you know, if anybody has any questions about pipe flow or, or verification study models, please uh, reach out. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.